facial dermatosis are a diverse disease problem and can be caused by multiple etiologies. Some of them working as a simple factor, some of them working in a multifactorial fashion. They are characterized by various clinical signs and lesion distributions. For example, facial folds in specific breeds constitute an area prone to maceration and microbial overgrowth, whereas in other breeds, the mucocutaneous junctions can be affected by various immunomediated autoimmune diseases. Potential causes of facial dermatosis can be grouped as follows. Among the infectious causes, canine acne is relatively common and seen in specific breeds such as short-coated dogs like Great Dane, Dobermans, Boxers or Mastiffs. And uh, it is characterized by multiple uh, papules and pustules affecting the chin. Mucocutaneous pyoderma is less common and controversial and uh, um, can be due to multiple etiologies with uh, generally um, lesions present at the level of the mucocutaneous junctions that respond to antibiotic treatment. Common conditions affecting the face include, and the, that can be seen in many individuals um, include dermatophytosis, malassezia dermatitis, demodicosis and sarcoptic mange. On the other side, deep mycosis um, are less common and might be seen mostly in immunocompromised individuals. Hypersensitivity disorders are also common and uh, they are uh, generally seen in first opinion practice, especially atopic dermatitis and or uh, food hypersensitivities. Um, less commonly, conditions still characterized by a hypersensitivity reaction include contact dermatitis or, specifically when an acute onset is involved, another condition can be eosinophilic furunculosis of the face, which is believed to be caused by insect or spider bites. Potential causes of facial dermatosis, as already said, include um, immunomediated autoimmune conditions, uh, with the most common being pemphigus foliaceus. Uh, less common conditions include pemphigus vulgaris, bullus pemphigoid, and mucous membrane pemphigoid. Among the group of the autoimmune conditions, we have also um, lupus with the different manifestations, including mucocutaneous lupus and systemic lupus. Um, Uveodermatologic syndrome, mostly reported in Japanese Akitas and Chao Chao, where the dermatological signs are linked also to non-dermatological issues such as ophthalmic problems, and erythema multiforme, uh, with or without drug reactions. Among the neoplastic conditions, uh, uh, the most common include squamous cell carcinoma, seen mostly in um, white-colored um, animals following to sun exposure, and epitheliotropic lymphoma, which is characterized by a plethora of clinical signs, some of them involving the haired skin, some of them the mucocutaneous junctions. Then there are a variety of conditions including paraneoplastic nutritional emission lanes, and the typical examples would be superficial necrolytic dermatitis, which can be linked to um, hepatopathies or glucagonomas, uh, zinc-responsive dermatosis, or idiopathic conditions like hereditary parakeratosis of Labrador retrievers and vitiligo. A rigorous and methodical diagnostic approach is very important, and this includes fundamental including history taking, a clinical examination which is both general and dermatological, and making a list of differential diagnoses. The use of specific diagnostic tests can help restricting the list of differentials, 
reach a diagnosis and evaluate the treatment options. History supplies vital important information and relevant points, including the breed predisposition. In fact, there are specific breeds such as brachiocephalic dogs that are predisposed to development of facial fold dermatitis or Spaniards specifically lip fold dermatitis. But also um, there are breeds where uh, the medical predisposition makes them uh, prone to development of allergies and autoimmune diseases. As already said, another important point includes color, with white colored animals that can develop solar induced dermatosis, as in this cat, where uh, the ear pinna, mostly on the tip and uh, in its central part of its top, is characterized by alopecia, erythema, marginal scaling and crusting, essentially consistent with actinic keratosis, which is a condition um, characterized histologically by dysplastic changes, which can further develop into neoplastic changes, such as in squamous cell carcinoma. Age at onset plays also an important role. In fact, in puppies, um, the majority of conditions will have a basis that is either genetic or parasitic infectious. And in young adults, uh, the most common conditions affecting the face will be allergies, parasites, infectious or nutritional. Neoplastic, metabolic or autoimmune conditions instead are mostly seen in middle-aged to elderly patients. Sex is also important, with, um, for example, entire male cats being more susceptible to trauma and secondary infections, including retroviral diseases. Lifestyle and traveling are often overlooked factors. For example, in young animals or those that live in groups, um, exposure to um, infectious organisms such as, such as dermatophytes um, can play an important role, as well exposure to wild animals that can transmit ectoparasitic diseases such as sarcoptic mange from foxes. Travelling plays also an important role for animals that are not uh, born in the UK and move to the UK from other countries and a typical example would be leishmaniosis in dogs coming from south of Europe. A good knowledge of dietary resources is very important, especially if we need to institute food trials or to evaluate the nutritional profile of ingredients in cases where we suspect the nutritional dermatosis. It is also important to, uh, to have a knowledge of the previous conditions, for example, gastrointestinal problems, which might lead to a diagnosis of uh, food-induced skin disease, uh, or ocular problems and respiratory problems which might be especially helpful in cats. Um, a previous history of drug exposure is also very important because on one side can lead us to again narrow the list of differential diagnoses, for example response to anti-inflammatory doses of corticosteroids might be suggestive of an allergic disease rather than an infectious disease or repeated exposure to topical medicaments in the ears um, followed by lack of resolution or worsening of the clinical signs might be suggestive of contact dermatitis. Additionally, it is important to be aware of any potential reactions to drugs happened in the past in order to avoid future exposure.
evidence of transmission to other animals and people is very important and helps narrowing down the list of differential diagnoses or even help directly to make a diagnosis as in this case where a family member developed these uh, lesions characterized by circular areas of um, erythema with marginal scaling and crusting and uh, um, similar lesions were also noted in the family cat. A diagnosis of, microsporum, of dermatophytosis caused by microsporum canis was made also with the help of this feature. Other characteristics that are very important um, include the type of onset, for example, acute or peracute onset. General clinical examination is of paramount importance, especially because it enables us to look for signs associated potentially with paraneoplastic or metabolic diseases, such as vomiting, diarrhea, polyuria, polydipsia, or to other conditions, for example, Leishmania or systemic lupus, specifically looking at lymphadenopathy, um, uveitis, epistaxis, or simply poor general condition. Once again, in cats, it's especially important to evaluate the presence of respiratory signs. This is an example of a, um, a dog affected by leishmaniasis um, living in the south of Italy. Um, this dog developed initially uh, bilateral uveitis, but other signs present included lymphadenomegaly and epistaxis. And uh, um, further in the course of disease, he developed also necrosis of the ep uh, tips of the easier pin. The most important parts of a dermatological examination are as follows. The analysis of lesion distribution and the analysis of type of lesion. In particular, lesion distribution can be helpful because while there are some conditions that will affect only the haired skin, um, such as dermatophytosis or demodicosis, other, for example, autoimmune conditions, might affect both the haired and the non-haired skin, including the mucocutaneous junctions and the oral cavity. The type of lesions can also help to discriminate between different conditions. Um, however, there are cases, like in this case, in this young Jack Russell, where there is a plethora of uh, lesions, including alopecia, erythema, scale, crusts, ulcerations, nodules, draining tracts. And interestingly, in this case, this patient was affected by two diseases. Uh, one was an ischemic dermatopathy and the other was a nocardiosis secondary to a foreign body implantation. The presence of pruritus can also help to discriminate between conditions such as dermatophytosis, where typically pruritus is not reported, or um, ectoparasitic diseases such as sarcoptic mange or allergic diseases such as atopic dermatitis, where instead patients are pruritic. In this case, it is, however, important to highlight that the discrimination between pruritus and non pruritic conditions can be arbitrary. The involvement of other areas can also lead to analyze the patient and identify the possibility of conditions that have a more generalized uh, distribution. From now on, a series of clinical cases will be presented, reviewing signalment, clinical history and dermatological examination, following by diagnosis and a brief discussion. This is a seven-year-old female neutered Burmese cat presented with a progressive history of lesions affecting the haired and non-haired skin and the mucocutaneous junctions. The lesions are characterized by crusts and ulcerations, 
And uh, in regard to the facial distribution, they involve both ear pin, in particular the inner aspects and the margins, the periocular area, the bridge of the nose, and the nasal plenum. Other body areas are involved, including the mammillae, uh, where noticeable yellowish crusts are present. Pemphigus filiaceus is the most common autoimmune skin disease. It's seen more commonly in dogs than in cats. And in cats, there is no breed predisposition described. They can occur at any age starting from one year, one year of age with a median of five years. Lesions are normally pustules and crusts with the pustules less commonly seen in cats than in dogs. And as in dogs, lesions are often characterized by a striking bilateral symmetry. This one-year-old entire male Labrador Retriever was presented with an acute onset of erythema and pruritus, affecting the periorbital area with ocular discharge and prima primary conjunctivitis with secondary blepharitis. The lesions occurred acutely after application of an eye ointment and most likely were consistent of allergy contact dermatitis. This is described as a type 4 hypersensitivity, which in contrast to irritant contact dermatitis is due to an immunological reaction to an hapten, which is usually a small chemically reactive lipid, lipid soluble molecule. And the, the type of reaction is also called apten type hypersensitivity. Normally, these conditions appear acutely and are manifested with erythema, macules, papules, and more rarely vesicles. In this case, the major clinical sign was the conjunctivitis due to the application of the eye ointment, followed by a skin irritation as a secondary problem. This eight years old malnutrient domestic short hair presented with a history of inspiratory stertor and lesions on the haired skin with alopecic, with analopecic and ulcerated mass localized on the forehead. Further examination revealed also the presence of alopecic papules and nodules on one of his legs. Following histopathology, the diagnosis confirmed was cryptococcosis, which is an uncommon, but the most common um, deep mycosis seen in cats. And uh, um, typically cats with nasopharyngeal cryptococcosis develop inspiratory stertor and breathe with an open mouth. Skin and subcutaneous tissue is involved in up to 40% of the cases, with lesions being papules, nodules, abscess, ulcers, and draining tracts, distributed most often on face, ear pin, and paws. A two-year-old entire male Samoyeds presented with a history of acute onset, alopecia, with uh, coalescing papules, nodules, and plaques superficially ulcerated, delimited mostly to the dorsal bridge of the muscle and affecting only the haired skin. The condition involved also the margins of the ear pin with presence of crusting and small ulcerations. The clinical signs appeared acutely within one to two hours after a walk in a rural area. And uh, the combination of history and clinical features suggested a most likely diagnosis of eosinophilic furunculosis of the face, which is believed to be an immunological process secondary to insect or spider bites.
The clinical severity of eosinophilic furunculosis of the face can be variable. In this three-year-old male neutered English setter, the lesions as, previ as previously described were coalescing papules and plaques, alopecic, erythematous and superficially ulcerated, involving the haired skin of the muzzle. The dog was at the same time lethargic and he developed paraxia. He was hospitalized and only after receiving fluids and several days of glucocorticoids, he started to recover. Contrary, this two-year-old entire male crossbreed with exactly the same clinical signs was systemically well and he improved very rap rapidly with uh, doses of course, uh, oral prednisolone at around one milligram per kilo with a rapid resolution of the lesion where only mild scarring al alopecia remained. This three months old female Staffordshire Bull Terrier was presented with a progressive history over a few days of alopecia, plaques, nodules and ulcerations involving the dorsal muscle, the chin, in a symmetrical fashion the periocular areas and the ear pin. He had the also um, enlargement of the peripheral lymph nodes. The age at onset and the clinical features were highly suggestive of juvenile granulomatous dermatitis and lymphadenitis, called also juvenile cellulitis. This is believed to be an immunomediated condition, and although the etiology has never been completely elucidated, several triggers have been uh, potentially described, including infections, drugs and vaccinations. It involves typically young dogs, but can be seen also in adults. A two-year-old male neutered Tibetan terrier presented with pruritus and alopecia, with hyperpigmentation, lichenification and erythema, interesting solely the periorbital skin. After ruling out ectoparasitic diseases and treating skin infections, the most common differential diagnoses in this case were hypersensitivity skin conditions, including atopic dermatitis, food or non-food involved. After a dietary trial, which unsuccessfully controlled the clinical signs, a clinical diagnosis of atopic dermatitis triggered by environmental allergens was made. Atopic dermatitis is classically described as a genetically predisposed inflammatory skin disease with characteristic clinical lesions, which involve often the perianal skin, the ear pin, the paws and the face, with particular regards to the periocular areas. This dog developed particularly striking lesions localized only on the periorbital areas. A five-year-old male neutered domestic shorter presented with a progressive history of ulcerations and crusting affecting the, the non-haired skin of the nasal plane. There was no previous history of skin disease and no evidence of pruritus. The list of differential diagnoses included at the top squamous cell carcinoma, which was further confirmed by histopathology. Squamous cell carcinoma is a common malignant neoplasm of dogs and cats, associated most often with chronic sun exposure and lack of pigment in the hair in the areas where the neoplasm develop, along with thin air coats on the same sides. It is usually preceded by actinic keratosis and is seen in normally in geographical areas characterized by long periods of intense sun exposure.
these one-year-old male neutered domestic long hair presented with ulcerations and hemorrhagic crusting localized to the mucocutaneous junctions of the eyelid and of the nasal plenum. The nasal plenum presented also with a small linear ulcerations at the level of the philtrum. Skin biopsies were taken and the histopathological examination revealed a separation at the dermo-epidermal junction and although a specific diagnosis was not reached, um, the diagnosis was a presumed sub-epidermal blistering skin disease of immunomediated etiology. Um, a course of oral corticosteroids at immunosuppressive doses led to a rapid improvement and to date, uh, pulse therapy with low doses of corticosteroids have kept the condition under control. Subepidermal blistering skin diseases are normally characterized by lesions such as depigmentation, erythema, transient vesicles, erosions and ulcerations, most commonly distributed in areas of the mucocutaneous junction and of the nasal plenum and of the oral mucosa, especially where friction is present. A four-year-old male German Shepherd dog was presented with a history of pruritus and skin lesions affecting the haired skin of the face, particularly localized on the periocular areas and dorsal muscle, consisting in alopecia and erythema. As previously said, the lesions were pruritic, and this dog also presented with gastrointestinal problems, consisting in increased defecation, tenesmus, and sometimes diarrhea. An elimination diet performed by using a hydrolyzed commercially available diet resulted in reduction of the clinical signs and every challenge led to an aggravation of the problem. A clinical diagnosis of adverse reaction to food was made and long-term treatment with the specific hydrolyzed diet uh, maintained the clinical signs under control. Clinical signs of adverse reaction to food, as in this case, um, can be identical to those of atopic dermatitis, and this is dog in particular, the lesions were only uh, facially distributed. A 12-year-old female neutered poodle presented with skin lesions affecting the haired and non-haired skin of the face and of other parts of the body, characterized by ulceration and depigmentation localized at the level of the nasal plenum and the, on the lip margins, and alopecia, intense erythroderma and scaling affecting the forehead, the dorsal neck, and further the dorsal trunk. The list of differential diagnoses included cutaneous epithelotropic lymphoma, which was confirmed on histopathology. Cutaneous epithelotropic lymphoma is an important differential diagnosis for diseases of the nasal plenum characterized by depigmentation and ulcerations. Clinical signs include also, as in this case, um, alopecia, erythema, scaling. And these particular signs often uh, can create confusion, mistaking this condition for allergic skin diseases, whereas instead, lesions affecting the mucocutaneous junctions might create confusion by mistaking this condition with autoimmune, condition, uh, autoimmune diseases. A four-year-old male neutered Springer Spaniel presented with a history of progressing ulceration, nasal plenum, and the footpads of all four feet. Due to a previous diagnosis of immunomediated hemolytic thrombocytopenia, this dog had been treated for several months with immunosuppressive doses of oral prednisolone and cyclosporine. 
and history suggested a possible deep opportunistic infection caused either by bacteria or fungi. Histopathological examination of skin specimens revealed the presence of a deep mycosis, most likely caused by Alternaria alternata microorganisms. These are ubiquitous saprophytic fungi found in various soil and organic materials, and infections develop via wound contaminated uh, through uh, wood splinters and bites. Immunosuppressive individuals might be at risk of developing disseminated disease. A five-year-old female neuter German presented with a history of ulcerations affecting the mucocutaneous junctions, both on the haired and non-haired skin, mostly at the perioral skin. There was no previous history of skin disease, neither other body areas were affected. There was a rapid response to oral corticosteroids with relapse after discontinuation. A CT scan examination of the oral cavity and of the neck revealed the presence of a laryngeal carcinoma and the skin biopsies of the skin lesions revealed a histo histological features consistent with erythema multiforme. Erythema multiforme is a condition uncommon in dogs and rare in cats, characterized by either acute or chronic onset of an inflammatory reaction histologically described with apoptosis, which means cell death, and lymphocytic satellitosis. It is manifested with various clinical signs, including ulcerations, and trigger factors described include drugs, food, neoplasia, infections, but a large variety of cases can be idiopathic. A six-year-old female neutered Cocker Spaniel presented with a long history of progressive erythema, edema, and purulent discharge present on the leaf folds and on the surrounding skin, with additionally presence of halitosis. The bit predisposition and elimination of other causes led to a diagnosis of lip fold dermatitis, which, as previously described, is due to a conformation of the region, which can predispose to friction and secondary microbial overgrowth and infections. In this case, intense topical therapy and followed by regular cleansing led to um, resolution and control of the condition. A six-year-old male neutered German Shepherd presented with a progressive onset of skin disease, manifested with crusting, pustules and ulcerations affecting the haired and non-haired skin with facial distribution. The lesions involved the dorsal muscle, the nasal plenum, and the periorbital areas. However, other areas involved included the footpads and the mucocutaneous junctions of the anus. The list of differential diagnoses included pemphigus foliaceus and cutaneous lupus. And further tests confirmed a diagnosis of pemphigus foliaceus. This is the most common type of pemphigus seen in dogs, and it is immunologically characterized by autoantibodies targeting adhesion molecules between keratinocytes. A six-year-old male neutered German Shepherd presented with lesions affecting the non air skin of the nasal plenum consisting in depigmentation and ulcerations. In this collie, similar lesions were noted, however, they were less severe and involved only one side of the nose. Initially, they were characterized by depigmentation, followed by presence of small ulcers. 
In both cases, there was no previous history of skin disease and no other body regions were involved. Histopathological examination of skin specimens revealed features consisting with cutaneous lupus erythematosus, also called the discoid lupus erythematosus. This is the most common type of autoimmune disease causing lesions on the nasal plenum, and both German Shepherds and Collie are described as potentially predisposed. Initial clinical signs consist in depigmentation and loss of colbestone appearance of the nasal plenum, but with time the disease progress in erythema, scaling, erosions and ulcerations, with crusting that might also appear. Although the condition is, is very likely affecting the nasal plenum, other body areas are also being described. A nine-year-old female neutered Jack Russell Terrier treated with immunosuppressive doses of corticosteroids because of an immunomediated medical condition uh, developed progressively alopecia affecting the earth's skin with evidence of multifocal crusting and hyperpigmentation. Very mild subtle crusting and scaling was also noted. The outdoor lifestyle of this animal and the immunocompromised status suggested a possible infectious disease and uh, further testing, including a dermatophyte culture, revealed um, a dermatophytic growth of trichophyton mentagrophytis species. This type of dermatophytosis um, can be, free, can be um, frequently acquired by animal um, in contact with wildlife, especially rodents and hedgehogs. And trichophyton mentagrophytes species are the most commonly isolated from the face. These four-year-old female neutered Rottweiler colicross presented with a history of progressive depigmentation of the nasal plenum. The list of differential diagnoses was vast, inclusive also, inclusive also of vitiligo, which was further confirmed, confirmed on histopathology. Vitiligo is an acquired immunomediated skin disease associated with melanocyte destructions, which result in areas of leukoderma with or without leukotrichia. It is uncommon and reported as hereditary in different breeds, including Rottweilers. A five-year-old entire male crossbreed imported from south of Italy developed progressive depigmentation of the nasal plenum, followed by systemic signs such as weight loss, polyuria polydipsia, and peripheral lymphadenopathy. The history and clinical signs made cutaneous leishmaniosis a possible differential diagnosis, and this was further confirmed by laboratory findings. The disease is caused by protozoa called Lesmania infantum, and dogs imported from endemic areas might develop the condition months or years later. It is transmitted to humans and animals by blood-sucking sunflies of the genus Phlebotomus and is typical in the old world of southern European countries. A three-year-old female neutral labradoodle is consisting in depigmentation of the nasal plenum and of the lower and upper lips. Lesions involved also part of the eyelids and the chin where papules and nodules were present. The list of differential diagnoses in this case was vast and histopathology revealed features consistent with cutaneous epitheliotropic lymphoma, a disease quite unusual in a dog of this age. This one-year-old male neutered domestic short hair presented with a skin condition 
manifested as erythema, excoriations, alopecia, and pruritus, affecting the herd skin, mostly on the face and ear pin. A close-up reveals an area of erythema with excoriated papules above the eyelids. The list of differential diagnoses in this case included parasitic diseases, allergic skin diseases, as well as dermatophytosis. By ruling out some of the differential diagnoses, we'll, we reached a, a diagnosis of a feline atopic dermatitis. A 13-year-old male neutered domestic shorter presented with a, a progressive history of um, crusting eruptions affecting mostly the forehead and the face and the ear pin uh, with presence of transient pustules. The disease caused also alopecia and was non-pruritic. A very prominent features, feature was also the presence of whitish caseus purulent discharge affecting most of the nail bases, which on cytology revealed presence of acantholytic cells. In this case, the list of differential diagnoses included at the top pemphigus foliaceus, which was further confirmed by histopathological examination of skin biopsy specimens. Papular nodular lesions, soft on palpation, with mild alopecia and erythema, were described in this three-year-old male neutered domestic short-air cat. Further history revealed also presence of mild pruritus and overgrooming. The lesions involved the chin, the lower and upper lips. In this case, the, the list of differential diagnoses was vast. History suggests also that treatment with oral glucocorticoids led to nearly complete resolution with flares after discontinuation. A histopathological examination of skin biopsy specimens revealed features consisted with the eosinophilic granuloma complex, which is a common cutaneous, mucocutaneous or oral mucosa uh, type of lesion reported in cats. It is described as a cutaneous reaction pattern to different triggers, including, including allergies and infections. When affecting the chin, lesions can be soft on palpation and in the past have been referred as soft chin or feline chin edema. Crusting and, and exudate present at the level of the skin folds with presence of lichenification were the clinical signs noted in this three-year-old female neutered Sharpe. The lesions were also extremely pruritic. Associating the clinical signs with cytological findings, a diagnosis of a skin fold pyoderma was reached. As, previ as previously discussed, the anatomical conformation in specific breeds can predispose to um, localized or generalized skin disease. Um, in this case, the presence of skin folds generating increased friction, increased humidity, pH and maceration creates a, an environment favorable to pollution of bacteria, secondary bacterial or malassezia overgrowth and infections then lead to the clinical manifestation. This one-year-old entire male dog de Bordeaux was presented with a condition characterized by alopecia, erythema, hyperpigmentation and comedo formation affecting the herd skin. The condition was non-pruritic. At the first presentation, the lesions affected mostly the face. However, progressively other areas became involved, including the dorsal neck and the dorsal trunk. Breed predisposition, history and age at onset 
made a diagnosis of juvenile demodicosis high likely, and this was further confirmed by examination of skin scrapings. Canine demodicosis is a parasitic condition caused by excessive multiplication uh, in hair follicles and sebaceous glands of the otherwise the host-specific mite demodex canis. A one-year-old entire male Labrador retriever presented with a skin disease affecting the nasal plenum, characterized by depigmentation, scaling, crusting, and fissuring. Another young Labrador retriever presented with similar clinical signs with more severe depigmentation and crusting. In both cases, the list of differential diagnoses included diseases such as cutaneous lupus erythematosus and, due to the young age at onset and the breed predisposition, hereditary nasal parakeratosis of Labrador retrievers, which was confirmed in both cases by histopathological examination of the affected skin. This condition has been reported in various countries, including UK, America and Australasia, and is characterized by lesions affecting the nasal plenum with an age at onset between 6, six and 12 months. It presents with typical histopathological features, and therefore histopathology is required for, for, for a, um, a confirmation of diagnosis. Multiple exophytic and papular nodular lesions affecting the muscle, including the upper and lower lips, were described in this one and a half year old male neutered Irish water spaniel with approximately six months duration. Clinical signs and age at onset were suggestive of oral papillomatosis, which was further confirmed on a histopathological examination of the affected skin. Oral papillomatosis is caused by papilloma virus infections, affecting the lips, the oral cavity, and sometimes the tongue, the palate, and the epiglottis. This condition is seen in young dogs and starts normally with a soft, smooth, plaque-like lesion, which then can evolve into a cauliflower-like lesion. Typically, there is a spontaneous regression after a few weeks. Once a list of differential diagnoses has been carefully prepared, based on history and clinical signs, each condition should be ruled in or out by carefully choosing specific tests. The most common test used in dermatological conditions includes skin scrapings, often used to detect demodex or sarcoptic mites, hair plaques, used also for demodex mites or to examine the hair bulb or the tips of the hair, Cytology, normally used to look for specific, specific features of infections such as pyoderma or malassezia dermatitis, or to look at the evidence eventually of neoplastic cells or acantholytic cells during autoimmune mediated diseases such as pemphigus foliaceus. Bacterial culture, dermatophyte culture, skin biopsies obviously have a fundamental reason to be used in several conditions. And among allergy tests, the one utilized to rule in or out conditions include food trials and uh, uh, patch tests to specifically look at uh, allergy contact dermatitis. Other tests, such as um, diagnostic imaging techniques, including ultrasound, radiographs, CT scan, MRI scan, or hematology, biochemistry, specific cultures, or PCR can be used when uh, a systemic condition is suspected. A trichogram consists in examination of hair, focusing specifically to the status of the hair tip, to the status of the hair shaft, and to the status of the root. Particularly looking at the tips, we can highlight the presence of uh, fractures or splitting, most likely suggestive of self-trauma. Looking at the shaft can highlight, highlight the status of the cortex and or the presence of mel macromelanosome within the hair shaft. And uh, uh, looking at the bulbs, not only we can look at the um, status 
of the hair cycle, but also at the presence of demodex mites. Skin scrapings are techniques performed by, via a scalpel blade, normally number 10, uh, collecting material either superficially, specifically to look for evidence of sarcoptic mites, or deeply, specifically to look at the presence of demodex mites. Cytology can be performed either by tape strip examination or impression smear. Tape strip can be useful for um, greasy lesions and for skin folds, while impression smears can be used um, if there is evidence of uh, draining sinuses or intact pustules that can be, uh, um, can be gently broken, uh, smearing the content of the pustule onto the glass slide. A typical example of tape strip here showing evidence of a malassezia overgrowth. Skin biopsies can be particularly useful, especially um, to rule in or out autoimmune and neoplastic conditions. In most of the cases, they are done by using a 6 mm punch uh, biopsy. Um, however, a 4 mm uh, biopsy punch can be used for smaller lesions or for areas where a large sample cannot be taken. When approaching patients with skin disease and when systemic problems are suspected, history and general examination are of paramount importance, especially when clinical signs such as polyuria polydipsia, weight loss or inappetence are present. In these cases, full blood work and urine analysis should be performed, and for animals imported from areas where leishmania microorganisms are present, further tests should be considered, including PCR from lymph nodes, bone marrow aspirates, and PCR for tissues, as well as Leishmania ELISA serology. When paranoplastic syndromes are suspected, diagnostic imaging should be considered, including a variety of techniques such as chest radiographs, abdominal ultrasound, CT or MRI scans. When most of these um, tests are negative and diagnosis has not yet been made, we should consider the presence of nutritional problems and in some of these cases, for example zinc responsive dermatosis, histopathology can be helpful. This is an example of superficial necrolytic dermatitis in a nine-year-old female neutered West Island White Terrier. Superficial necrolytic dermatitis is a condition characterized, like in this case, by crusting and scaling affecting often the mucocutaneous junctions of the mouth and the periocular skin. Other areas involved often include the footpads, when where hyperkeratosis and fissures can be noted, and in this case the tail was also involved with presence of crusting. This condition accompanies uh, the presence of hepatic disease of, or, more regularly, or more rarely a glucagonoma. In this patient, ultrasonographic examination of the abdominal organs detected the presence of a honeycomb appearance of the liver indicating the presence of a hepatopathy. This is the first of a series of slides in which treatment options will be briefly discussed. It is generalized accepted that for localized demodicosis, there is no need for treatment as 90% of the cases will resolve spontaneously. Advice is for monitoring and performing skin scrapings every four to six weeks until resolution. If number of mites increase, then treatment should be started. Other important considerations in treating canine demodicosis regard the evaluation of presence of deep or superficial bacterial pyoderma. And it is generally advised that uh, systemic treatment is not needed uh, in most of the cases, as topical antibacterial therapy combined with good miticidal agents might be sufficient unless severe bacterial infection is present. When treating animals with generalized demodicosis, 
monitoring is important and they should be evaluated clinically and microscopically with repeated skin scrapings every month until second negative skin scraping. The multicidal therapy should be continued four weeks after the second set of negative monthly scraping to decrease the risk of a disease recurrence. Options available for treatment of generalized demodicosis are various and they change depending on country legislation and on the status of the single patient. Generally, there is consensus that weekly amitraz rinses are effective for canine demodicosis and that long-haired animals should be clipped before the application. More recently, there have been a large number of studies evaluating the efficacy of the ixoxazolines for canine demodicosis in pet dogs, and the published data are very encouraging and make this drug class an excellent treatment option for dogs with demodicosis. Other options currently not licensed in the UK include oral ivermectin given on a daily basis, um, oral moxidectin given on a daily basis, and oral milbemycin given on a daily basis. Doramectin can also be used by weekly subcutaneous injections. When using these drugs, um, it is important to do an initial gradual dose increase for systemic, specifically for systemic moxidectin and ivermectin to identify dogs sensitive to toxicosis induced by those microcyclic lactones. Additionally, the use of topical moxidectin imidacloprid spot on should be considered but only for mild to moderate cases of canine demodicosis. Although in healthy individuals the infection may resolve spontaneously, treatment is necessary in all cases to speed up the resolution because of the risk of infection of humans and contact animals. Optimal therapy of dermatophytosis requires a combination of topical antifungal therapy concurrent systemic antifungal therapy and the environmental decontamination. Topical therapy is important in reducing environmental contamination and works synergistically with the systemic therapy. The only product licensed for the topical treatment of dermatophytosis in cats is a shampoo containing chlorhexidine and myconazole. It is to be used twice weekly and it's important to allow a contact time of 10 minutes before rinsing it off. Other products that might be suggested for topical therapy but are not specifically licensed for cats include lime sulfur, which is used as a dips twice weekly. Anilconazole can be used as a dip twice weekly. It is licensed for use in dogs, horses and cattle, but not in cats. Anecdotal reports have stated possible toxicity, but limited experimental work has failed to reproduce these effects. It is difficult to justify this product in cats instead of myconazole, chlorhexidine or lime sulfur. The only product licensed for veterinary use in the UK in cats is itraconazole available in a liquid formulation. The recommended regime is one week of therapy followed by one week of therapy, repeated for three weeks of treatment. The rationale of this alternate weekly basis regime is due to the capacity of this drug to be incorporated into the skin and hairs and slowly released, having a residual effect when discontinued. The product is safe to use in kittens from 10 days of age but the manufacturer recommends avoiding the product in pregnant or lactating queens. Ketoconazole is the only licensed product in the UK for treatment of dermatophytosis in dogs. Monitoring liver enzymes during therapy is recommended and other options include use of terbinafine. Griseofulvin is no longer licensed for small animal treatment.
For feline cases, patients can be treated with weekly lime sulfur dips at a 2% concentration or amitraz baths at a concentration on 0.0125%. An easier alternative can be the weekly administration of a spot-on containing moxidectin and imidacloprid. When treating animals with bacterial pyoderma, special considerations should be taken, especially in context of the increasing antimicrobial resistance issue. And the skin, being a readily available organ, can provide opportunities for responsible use of antimicrobials. For example, in-house cytological examination of samples is a very valuable and easy tool to perform and can help to confirm the presence of bacterial infection and to monitor the treatment efficacy. Another major opportunity for responsible prescribing in pyoderma cases is the availability of topical antimicrobial therapy. Topical therapy is very important and there is good evidence for efficacy of chlorhexidine-based products. When treating extensive to generalized disease, treatment with shampoo, lotions, spray and rinses often combined together can be very useful and should be continued until resolution. For localized disease, for example, lesions affecting the skin folds, gels, creams, ointment, lotions and medicated wipes should be considered. When topical therapy is not possible, systemic treatment should be considered. However, there is a lack of adequately sized blind and randomized controlled trials, and treatment should be chosen based on the tire 1, 2, and 3 of the different types of antibiotics. Generally, we consider starting with tire 1, which can be chosen as empirical choice, and then moving to 2 and 3 only if culture and sensitivity results suggest the use of such antibiotics. It is generally accepted that usually for when treating superficial pyoderma with systemic medications, treatment should be continued for up to one week beyond clinical cure, while when treating deep pyoderma for up to two weeks beyond clinical cure. It is important also to highlight that treatment of deep pyoderma should be always based on culture sensitivity results when systemic medications are used. Treatment of Malassezia dermatitis is also available both in form of topical and systemic medications. Topical medications are the only one officially licensed in the UK and there is good evidence for recommending the use of 2% myconazole nitrate, 2% chlorhexidine gluconate shampoo twice a week for three weeks. Medicated wipes additionally can be useful for facial skin infections. However, the use of shampoo should be used in the first line. When topical treatment is not possible, the use of ketoconazole or itraconazole can be recommended with fair evidence of efficacy. When dealing with viral infections, literature suggests the use of several antiviral products, including, including interferon alpha, L-lysine, imiquimod, famcyclovir, interferon omega, and supportive treatment, which can be useful specifically when treating ulcerated lesions with secondary bacterial infections. Treatment of leishmaniosis is also defined with different protocols, with the drugs most commonly used including miltefacin, glucantim antimoniate and allopurinol, all of them used because of the antiprotozoal activity. There are several treatment options described for the treatment of cutaneous epithelotropic lymphoma, including the use of linoleic acids, for which there is lack of standardized trials and therefore cannot be recommended, the use of topical steroids in early phase, 
This type of treatment in humans has been described as successful in early cases. However, there is a lack of reports on efficacy in animals, uh, perhaps because uh, early cases ten tend to not be recognized. Meclotheramine, nitrogen mustard, has shown a good response in early stages, however, is carcinogenic, is potentially carcinogenic for owners and therefore cannot be recommended. Oral glucocorticoid and synthetic retinoids have a palliative effect and therefore they can be recommended in specific cases. And overall, the drug that is mostly used is lomastin, which shows a response rate of up to 80%. Side effects to be considered include myelosuppression and hepatotoxicity. Radiotherapy can be used in selected cases, especially when surgical debulkment is needed. And uh, there is also availability of different multimodal protocols. However, there is no evidence that the association of different um, products um, is advantageous versus single agent therapy. In course of immunomediated autoimmune diseases, such as, for example, pemphigus foliaceus, immunosuppressive doses of oral glucocorticoids are normally the mainstay of treatment. This can be used either with or without sparring agents that are commonly introduced in the maintenance phase in order to minimize the side effect caused by glucocorticoids. Sparring agents include azathioprine, chlorambucil, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, cyclosporin, the combination of otratrezacycline and niacinamide, IV human immunoglobulins, and most recently, there are reports of the efficacy in some case selected cases of oclacitinib. Topical tacrolimus is a valid agent for localized forms. Treatment of erythema multiforme is based upon identification and removal of the offending factors and on use of supportive care measures. In human medicine, the use of glucocorticoids is controversial because of the risk of sepsis. However, in dogs with severe disease, large doses of oral glucocorticoids have been successfully used with or without the use of azathioprine. Other agents anecdotally reports, reported uh, effective include cyclosporin, oclacitinib, and uh, IV human immunoglobulins. In cases of paraneoplastic disease, ideally the underlying neoplasia should be addressed. Treatment of superficial necrolytic dermatitis is symptomatic, and literature has shown only limited success. Generally, when secondary infections are present, they should be treated appropriately. And when the underlying problem identified is a glucagonoma, removal of the mass might lead to remission of signs and increased amino acids concentration. When patients have been diagnosed with an underlying liver condition, nutritional supplementation is important and palliative therapy can be done by either parenteral or oral amino acid supplementation, as well as zinc and fatty acids. This can be done by supplementing the diet with cooked or raw egg yolk, or by providing high quality, high protein diets. Additional treatment options described for superficial necrolytic dermatitis include the use of intravenous amino acid solution, for which definitive studies on the efficacy are lacking. The use of somatostatin analog ocreotide. This is a potent inhibitor of glucagon release and might be potentially effective in cases of glucagonomas. The use of 12-colchicin, an antifibrotic agent that has been used with mixed success in treating humans with possible cirrhosis and therefore could be considered for treatment of patients in which the condition is caused by an underlying hepatopathy. And finally, it is, it is worth to highlight that the use of oral prednisolone, which has been anecdotally 
suggested as potentially helpful must be considered cautiously because it might promote glucose intolerance and diabetes mellitus. Patients affected by zinc-responsive dermatosis might need treatment for life. Oral zinc supplementation, together with dietary corrections where appropriate, usually brings rapid resolution of signs in most of the cases. Depending on the form of zinc used, due to variation in its bioavailability, dosages might change. Zinc sulfate has to be given at 10 mg per kilo once daily, and more bioavailable forms, such as zinc gluconates, can be given at 5 mg per kilo, or zinc picolinate 1.5 mg per kilo, all once daily. In recalcitrant cases, intravenous zinc supplementation has been reported to be of benefit, however, there is risk for cardiac arrhythmia. There is anecdotal evidence that treatment with essential fatty acids and prednisolone might speed the clinical response, although it is unclear whether this is associated with enhanced uptake or utilization of zinc or amelioration of the cutaneous inflammation. Treatment with antiseboric shampoos is advisable to remove crusts and scales, and antibiotics and or antifungals might be necessary to control secondary infections. Finally, when dealing for, with self-traumatic lesions, the underlying problem should be investigated and addressed. This includes cases where the self-trauma is caused by allergies, by parasites, by neuropathic pain, or by behavioral disorders.